Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our monthly shop talk for July. Um, this month's session is COVID-19 update, definition changes for up-to-date COVID-19 vaccination status, and updates to COVID-19 surveillance pathways and COVID-19 vaccination modules. And again, if you're having any um, technical issues, please message technical support for assistance. So again, my name is Paula and I will be the presenter for today. Um, very briefly about me, I am a current doctor of public health student and an infection prevention technical advisor with Alliant Health Solutions. I have over 10 years of healthcare experience um, with a diverse background in public health, infection prevention, epidemiology, and microbiology. I have always um, enjoyed public health and identifying ways to improve health outcomes, um, specifically those related to healthcare associated infections. So to meet the rest of our patient safety team, um, first we have Donald. He has hosted many of Alliance's previous shop talks. Um, he has a wealth of knowledge in public health epidemiology and infection prevention. Um, over the past several years, he has worked um, as an infection preventionist at the hospital and system level where he was um, part of a task force to ensure the safety of caregivers and patients during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in addition, he was a part of and led several projects to reduce hospital acquired infections, utilizing Lean Six Sigma uh, methodologies. He is also trained in ensuring um, ongoing facility survey readiness for regulatory agencies, such as the CMS and Joint Commission. And next we have Erica. Erica is an, adult, is an adult gerontology nurse practitioner and infection preventionist with experience in primary care, critical care, healthcare administration, and public health. She was previously the interim hospital epidemiology director for a large healthcare system in Atlanta and a nurse consultant in the CDC's um, Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion. While at the CDC, she served as an infection prevention and control subject matter expert for domestic and international IPC initiatives and emergency responses, including Ebola outbreaks and most recently the COVID-19 pandemic. And lastly, we have Amy, who is our patient safety team manager. Um, Amy is a registered nurse with a diverse background in acute care nursing, microbiology, epidemiology, and infection control. Um, she is passionate about leading and mentoring new and future infection preventionists in their career paths and assisting them in reducing healthcare associated infections across the continuum of care. Um, and it's truly an honor to work with such an amazing um, team who has expert knowledge um, regarding NHSN and infection prevention and control. So now that you have met our patient safety team, um, let's move on to our agenda. So again, today we'll go over um, COVID-19 updates um, definition changes for up-to-date COVID-19 vaccination status, um, CMS updates, updates to COVID-19 surveillance pathways and COVID-19 vaccination modules, SAMS and NHSN updates, and lastly, our live um, Q&A ses um, Q session. So let's jump right in and start with um, our COVID-19 updates. Um, I always like to uh, start with these updates because I um, think it's so important, you know, to see how far uh, we have come along since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. And even though the COVID-19 um, public health emergency has ended, um, monitoring, you know, current COVID-19 trends and rates is still important. And the CDC still continues to provide um, COVID-19 data regarding hospital admission rates, death rates, and vaccination rates. So um, let's first look at um, our COVID-19 hospital admission rates in the U.S. So this data was last updated um, on July 
31st, 2023, and shows a total of um, 6,220 COVID-19 hospital admissions, which is a 0.8% uh, decline from the past week. And the number of um, COVID-19 hospital admissions per 100,000 for the past week is 1.87. So this, um, you know, continued to uh, decrease in hospital admission rates across the U.S., you know, is definitely, you know, reassuring that we are heading in the right direction with, um, you know, such, um, with such a lower rate of hospital um, admission rates. And this map just, again, it just shows the overall um, COVID-19 hospital admission rates in the U.S. Um, by county. And again, with the majority of counties with less than 10 um, new COVID-19 hospital admissions per 100,000 population. So again, you know, we see lots of green with maybe just a few, uh, maybe two or three counties with um, higher um, hospital admission rates. We have about two that are within the 10 to 19.9 and two that are greater than 20. So again, overall, um, you know, very low hospital um, admission rates. So regarding COVID-19 um, deaths, again, so this information was last updated on July 1st, 2023, and shows currently um, the percent of COVID-19 deaths in the past week, which is 1%. And this is a 9.1 um, decrease in deaths from the past week and a negative 0.01 absolute change from, uh, from the prior week. So again, very reassuring, you know, to see, um, you know, a, such a, a downhill trend in COVID-19 deaths again, which is what we like to see and what we want to see. So this map again is also of our um, COVID-19 death and just shows the US percentage of deaths due to COVID-19 in the past week. Again, with all states um, within that one to 2% range, um, we just have a slightly high percentage with the territories and that's about six to 7.9%. So again, overall um, significantly um, lower um, death rates. And lastly, I wanted to look at the percentage of um, adults in the U.S. 65 years and older who are up to date with COVID-19 vaccines. And this information is, um, is current through June 30th, 2023. So as you can see, it does vary from state to state, but uh, many states have at least, you know, 20 percent that are up to date and some that are 80 percent and above. So definitely um, um, you know, reassuring vaccination rates among this um, among this population. And again, to just focus on um, adults um, 65 years and older, this first um, chart shows the um, um, count of individuals who received at least one COVID-19 vaccine. So again, looking right here, we have um, over 58 million, um, you know, individuals 65 and over who received at least one dose. And for the amount um, that completed their primary series, again, for the population 65 and over, we have over 51 million. And those that are considered um, up to date with their latest bivalent um, booster is over 23 million. So, again, uh, this population is doing extremely well with um, with um, COVID-19 vaccines. So that's all I have for a COVID-19 update. So now we can um, move on to definition changes for up-to-date COVID-19 um, vaccination status. So beginning on June 26, 2023, which is the reporting period quarter three for 2023, residents and healthcare personnel are considered up to date with their COVID-19 vaccinations if they have received an updated bivalent vaccine. So an individual is considered up to date once they have received one updated bivalent Pfizer or bivalent Moderna uh, COVID-19 vaccine. And this up-to-date definition is the same for all individuals, um, regardless of age and immunocompromised status. So what's the difference between up-to-date and completed series? So again, for up-to-date, this means that an individual has received 
one updated and again updated by valent um, Pfizer or bivalent Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Whereas for a completed series, this means an individual um, received a two-dose series of a monovalent COVID-19 vaccine or a single dose of Janssen or a single dose of, um, of bivalent vaccine. And again, I didn't um, specify updated, so it's just a single dose of um, uh, Bivalent. So again, these definitions apply for the quarter three um, reporting period. And just for um, as a side note, the CDC did first recommend the updated um, bivalent vaccines in early um, September 2022. So now let's look at our CMS updates related to COVID-19. So there have been um, a lot of questions about staff, um, you know, regarding the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. So in November, um, as we all remember, in November 2021, um, CMS implemented an interim final rule um, requiring staff, including volunteers um, in most Medicare and Medicaid certified settings um, to complete the primary series of COVID-19 vaccination or be granted an approved exemption in order to work in or provide um, services on behalf of the certified setting. And on June 5th, 2023, the final rule withdraws the regulatory provision set forth um, on November 5th, 2021 in the Omnibus COVID-19 Healthcare Staff Vaccination ending the staff COVID-19 vaccine mandate. So this rule is effective 60 days after the date of publication, again, which was June 5th, making the rule effective starting August 4th. Um, and I also included the link if you receive, if you um, take a look at your slides, I included the link um, at the bottom if anyone wants to, um, you know, take a further look at the, um, take a further look at, at the policy. And if you have any questions regarding um, CMS reporting requirements and quality reporting for long-term care facilities, I've listed um, their contact information. So for um, long-term care facilities, um, weekly reporting requirement questions, um, e you will email dnh underscore triage team at cms.hs.gov. And for skilled nursing facility um, quality report and program questions, you will email SNF quality questions at cms.hhs.gov. So now moving on to the, as I like to call the meat and potatoes of the presentation, um, let's move on to the updates to COVID-19 surveillance pathways and COVID-19 vaccination modules. So as many have noticed, their NHS informs have changed. Um, these changes and simplification will be implemented again in quarter three, which started June 26, 2023. And I'll walk you through each of these updates and changes. So there were changes again to both the COVID-19 surveillance pathways and the COVID-19 vaccination modules. So let's first start with the COVID-19 surveillance pathways. And this is the one that's um, here outlined in red. So once you, um, you know, typically log into your NHS and reporting and log into your long-term care component on your left-hand panel, this is where you'll see COVID-19 and then pathway data reporting. Um, and again, this is um, also um, your COVID-19 module webpage when you log on there. So we'll start here first. So to not confuse your surveillance pathway with your vaccination module. So again, so your surveillance pathway will um, reporting requirements. So for CMS certified facilities, again, they are required to report at least once every reporting week. And the requirement is to go through December 2024. For the COVID-19 vaccination mod module, this is your weekly reporting requirements for residents and staff. And you have your quarterly reporting for staff. So again, um, just right now, we're just going to focus on the COVID-19 um, surveillance pathway. 
So what changed? So regarding the uh, resident impact um, and facility, facility capacity or RIFC, in this section, you previously saw in, um, and documented newly positive tests, um, vaccination status, deaths, testing availability, influenza supplies, and PPE shortages. So testing availability, influenza supplies, and PPE shortages are no longer required. You will only report newly positive tests, vaccination status, and deaths. Um, for the next one, for staff and personnel impact, you previously um, documented newly positive COVID-19 tests, COVID-19 deaths, influenza, and staffing shortages. So COVID-19 deaths, influenza, and shorting sta um, short staffing shortages are no longer required. You will only report um, newly positive tests. And lastly, you uh, reported in a therapeutic section, and this included um, residents treated um, in-house stock and stock stored outside the long-term care facility. And this pathway will be removed entirely. Uh, there's also a new section added on hospitalizations. And within that um, section, you will have one that's um, considered not up to date. And in this section, um, this will be auto populated and included in the RIFC pathway. And again, I'll walk you through each of these, um, each of these changes. So this is a screenshot of what the updated um, RIFC COVID-19 pathway data reporting looks like. I'm pretty sure that everyone um, is familiar with. And again, I'll walk you through an, ex um, an example of this. So you first start with your current census. And again, so this is your total number of beds that are occupied on the reporting calendar day. So uh, if you have, you know, 100 beds, you will, you know, simply put 100 in here. Next, you move on to um, your resident impact for COVID-19 positive tests. And you wanna enter the number of newly positive um, COVID-19 viral tests results. So for example, um, a positive antigen test and or a positive PCR. Um, make sure it's important to not include residents who have a positive antigen test, but negative PCR. So you want to make sure you have that positive antigen test and or the PCR. Um, you also want to include um, uh, residents newly positive since the most um, recent date a data was collected for NHS and reporting. So moving on to your next field is um, the up-to-date vaccination status. So this is where it can get a little confusing for some individuals. So for this, again, you will include residents with a newly positive COVID-19 um, test who are up-to-date with COVID-19 vaccines 14 days or more before the specimen collection date. And again, you want to make sure that you're following the NHS and surveillance definition of up-to-date, which is um, having received that updated um, bivalent booster. So um, again, so for the RIFC pathway vaccination status, um, make sure you don't confuse this with the weekly COVID-19 vaccination summary data um, used to report um, cu um, cumulative vaccination coverage for residents who have received COVID-19 vaccination um, at the facility or, or elsewhere. And if you're starting to get a little confused, just, 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 just stick with me. Um, it'll make more sense as we, as we move along. So again, so for the RIFC pathway vaccination status, you have a 14 day window um, for determining vaccination status. So for residents with a newly positive uh, COVID-19 viral test, a COVID-19 vaccine dose received inside the 14 day window specifically um, received 13 days or less before the specimen collection date is not counted when um, reporting um, vaccination status. 
So just for an, an example, so Mr. Andrews received the primary COVID-19 vaccine series in 2021 and received two additional monovalent booster doses since then. He also received the bivalent dose 12 days ago. Mr. Andrews also tested positive um, for COVID-19 this week. But however, since he did not receive the bivalent dose 14 days or more prior to testing, he will not be included in the up-to-date count. And I hope that um, I hope that makes sense for you. So if, if it doesn't, so this this picture can help um, can help greatly if you're confused about the vaccination um, status 14 day um, window. So here on day one will be the day um, that um, the individual, you know, received their um, day, day of vaccination. And on day 13 here, if the specimen um, collection is positive, then vaccination is not counted because it's uh, 13 days, um, it's, it's 13 days or less. But if the um, specimen collection um, of the positive COVID-19 test is on day four, then it is counted. Um, and if that um, if that makes sense, you can just um, put it uh, just put a yes in the chat to let me know that you're that you're still with me there. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good. 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 All right. You all are great. Good. Okay. So let's um, let's move on to another example. So we have four residents in DH. DHQP nursing home um, who tested positive since the last date uh, data were reported to NHSN. So um, within these four residents who tested positive, we have two residents who received a monovalent booster dose six months after they received the primary series. And they also received the bivalent dose only two days ago. So that two days ago already is a hint that they would not be considered um, up to date. So for our third resident, um, one resident received a monovalent booster dose 12 months after they received their primary series of COVID-19 and then received the updated, uh, they received the bivalent dose two months ago. And our last resident um, received a second monovalent booster dose eight months after they received um, the primary um, series of COVID-19 vaccine, but they have not received any other COVID-19 vaccine since this time, and they have not received the bivalent dose. Okay, so how will we record these in the RIFC pathway? So again, we have four positive tests. So when we're entering in, we're, we'll put in our four here. We have four positive, these are new tests. Um, and if you can remember, we had the one, um, we had the one individual here who received their um, bivalent dose two months ago. So that will be the only one who is considered up to date. So we would put them here in one. And then the three is auto-populated. So the three would be for the two who received their bi bivalent dose two days ago and the one who never received, um, received theirs. And that's it. So I hope, I hope that helps. And this um, decision tree, if it's still a little confusing for you, um, this decision tree can be helpful to determine um, who is up to date with COVID-19 vaccines um, for the long-term care RIFC pathway for a quarter three reporting. So you, you wanna start with the first question. Um, again, so has the resident received an updated bivalent vaccine? Again, so if they have not received that updated bivalent vaccine, then no, they are not considered up to date. If they did receive it, um, did the resident receive the updated bivalent vaccine 14 days or more before the positive COVID-19 test? So again, this is looking back at that 14 day window. So if it was 13 days or less, then no, they're not up to date. But if it's 14 days or more, then yes, they are considered up to date. Okay, so the next section we have of the RIFC COVID-19 pathway data reporting is hospitalizations. And this is a screenshot of what this section um, looks like. 
So for hospitalizations, um, this is not a subset of the positive tests that we recently counted in an up-to-date section. In this section, you will only include the number of new hospitalizations with a COVID-19 test since the most recent date um, data were reported to NHSN. And again, I'll walk you through an example of how to determine. Okay, so for hospitalizations with a COVID, uh, with a positive COVID-19 test, again, this is simply just the number of residents who have been hospitalized with a positive COVID-19 test. But uh, just as a side note, only um, include residents who have been hospitalized um, during this reporting period and had a positive COVID test in the 10 days prior to the hospitalization um, data specimen um, hospitalization and the data specimen collection is considered a calendar day one. Um, for hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test and up to date. So this is based on the number reported um, previously um, for hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test um, and indicate the number of residents who were hospitalized with a positive COVID-19 test and also up to date with COVID-19 vaccinations at the time of the positive COVID-19 um, test. So again, so for hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test, so you wanna include um, individuals. So this would be number of residents who have been hospitalized for any reason and also had a positive COVID-19 test. And again, only include residents who have been hospitalized during this reporting period and had a positive COVID-19 test in the 10 days prior to the hospitalization and the data specimen um, collection is calendar day one. So how to, to, how to calculate? So first question, how many residents have been hospitalized since the last date data were reported to NHSN? And of those residents, how many had a positive COVID-19 test within the past 10 days? So while that might sound a little confusing, again, this decision tree can help you determine um, hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test. Um, so again, you always start with the first, you know, start with your first question here. So has the resident been admitted to the hospital since the last date data were reported to NHSN? If no, um, do not include um, hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test. If yes, did the resident have a positive COVID-19 test 10 days or less prior to the hospitalization? If no, then no, we're not gonna include them. If so, then yes, we will include them in the hospitalizations with a positive uh, COVID-19 test count. So for hospitalizations um, with a positive COVID-19 test and up to date. So again, this is based on the number reported for hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test and indicate the number of residents who were hospitalized with a positive COVID-19 test and also up to date with COVID-19 vaccinations at the time of the, of the positive COVID-19 test. So again, so how do you calculate? So start with how many residents have been included in the hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test count. And of those included in the hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test count, how many are up to date per the NHSN surveillance definition? Again, and that's having received that updated um, by Valent. And then of those who are up to date, how many received the vaccine 14 days or more before the newly positive COVID-19 test? So here, here we have another one, another decision tree to help you decide. So again, start with, was the resident included in the hospitalizations with a positive, um, with a positive COVID-19 test count. If they, they weren't included, then no, we're not including them in this category. If they were, again, is the resident considered up to date per the NHSN surveillance definition? Again, having received that um, updated by Valent. If not, we're not gonna include them. If, if they have, 
then did the resident receive the COVID-19 dose qualifying them as up to date 14 days or more before the positive COVID-19 test? If no, we're not including them. If they have, then yes, then this, these individuals will be um, included in hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test and up to date. So that was a lot. So let's go through an example to, to make sure that you, um, to make sure that you understand that. So for our example, we have Mr. Smith, who is an 89 year old resident who tested positive for COVID-19 five days ago. And since then he has been progressively experiencing more severe symptoms. Today, he has been experiencing shortness of breath and was transferred to the ER for further evaluation. So after spending several hours in the ER, Mr. Smith was admitted to the med search floor and stayed in the hospital for three days before returning to the facility. And Mr. Smith also received the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. So should Mr. Smith be included in the hospitalization count? That's our question. So let's start. So, Ms. so how many residents have been included in the hospitaliz hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test count? So while I'm reporting, we just have one. We just have Mr. Smith. He's our only resident who tested positive. So that's, we, we're only going to put one in, that, in this first box down here, hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test. So now we move on. So of those in the hospitalizations with a positive COVID-19 test count, how many are up to date per the NHSN surveillance definition? And again, it'll just be the one Mr. Smith because he did receive his updated um, bivalent booster last year, which qualifies him as up to date. And then of those who are up to date, how many received the COVID-19, how many received, I'm sorry, how many received the vaccine 14 days or more before the newly positive COVID-19 test? And again, it's just this one, Mr. Smith. So since you received the dose a year ago, of, of, um, this is you know more than 14 days um, prior to the newly positive COVID-19 test. So again, so when we're entering in these hospitalizations, we're just we just have one. We have the one Mr. Smith and then the one um, who's considered up to date. And does that make sense? And again, you can just put yes, um, yes in the chat to let me know if that makes sense. Yes, all right, you, you all are experts. Perfect. Okay, well now let's move on to the staff and personnel impact pathway. So for this pathway, um, again, um, there's only one um, section in this, and this is the positive count. And again, this will only be the reporting, um, the reporting variable in this pathway. Okay, so in this screenshot here, you can see that we are no longer here in the resident impact and facility capacity tab, the RIFC, but we're now in the staff and personnel impact. So again, the only question here is the number of positive tests. And again, this is just the number of staff and facility personnel with a newly positive COVID-19 test. And you wanna um, also, again, exclude staff and facility um, personnel who had a positive antigen test with negative PCR. You want that positive antigen and or um, positive PCR. And that's all we're doing for this. That's, that's the only thing we have to do for this tab. That is it. Okay, is everyone still with me? We are halfway through the changes. So now um, we can move on to um, COVID-19 um, vaccination module changes. So this is your um, weekly healthcare personnel and resident COVID-19 vaccination webpage. So that's when, so when you're logging on and when you, um, you know, go to, to log in right here, your COVID-19, that's when you're clicking um, 
this healthcare personnel section here. So that's the next section we're gonna focus on looking at these changes. So what changed for the weekly COVID-19 vaccination um, resident form? So for the first question, uh, the number of residents staying in this facility for at least one day during the week of data collection, there is no change to this. This question um, will continue to remain. Question 2.1 and 2.2, these are both removed. So it will no longer ask um, only one dose, only one dose of a two dose primary COVID-19 vaccine series and no longer ask um, any completed primary COVID-19 vaccine series. So these two are removed. Questions 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3. There are no change, but there, um, there, there is a uh, definition change. So 3.1, medical contraindication to COVID-19, offered but declined COVID-19 vaccine, and unknown COVID-19 vaccination status. So again, no change. These, these three questions are still, um, will still remain. Questions four uh, will be removed. So this is four, 4.1 and 4.2. So we have um, cumulative number of residents with um, complete primary series vaccine in question number two, who have received any boosters or additional doses of COVID-19 vaccine since August, 2021. So that is being removed. Um, the cumulative number of residents in question number four who have received only one booster dose of COVID-19 vaccine since August 2021, that's being removed. And again, uh, cumulative number of residents in question number four who received two or more booster doses of COVID-19 vaccine and the most recent dose um, was received since March 29, 2022. In question five, um, Will, it will remain, it will just be moved to question two. So this question asks um, individuals in question two who are up to date with COVID-19 vaccines. So um, when you were, when you previously reported, this is what this, um, this is what this section looked like. So again, what's being removed is the primary vaccine series and boosted those questions on questions two and four. So where these two X's are here, these are being removed. And we're keeping question one, um, questions 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 here. And question five is moving to question two. So this is a screenshot of the new version um, which is after removing the primary series and booster. So this is what um, most of you all have, um, this is what most of you all should see when you um, report. So again, um, number of residents staying at the facility, um, cumulative number of residents in question one who are up to date, and then three without um, medical contraindications offered but declined and unknown and other. So let's walk through an example using the new simplified, um, using this new um, simplified version. So we'll start with our question number one, very simple. How many residents are staying in this facility at least one day during the week of data collection? So I'm reporting for the week of 626 to, um, uh, 626 to 72. So I have 57 residents staying. So I will simply put in 57. So now we're gonna move on to the cumulative number of residents who are up to date. So out of this 57, um, out of this 57, we want the, um, again, who are up to date. So this means that we want the total that received their um, updated by valent. So I know, out of my 57 residents, 40 have received their updated bivalent. So they will go in this category here. So um, we want to make sure that our numbers match up with this 57. So since I have 40, I still have 17 that are unaccounted for. So we have to make sure we put these in correctly. So um, out, of, out of the 57, the 40 have received their updated. 
till now, um, I noticed that 10 have medical contraindications. So that's 10. Okay, so now I have 40 and 10. So I'm 50. But now I'm still seven short. So I have three that um, were that they're always, you know, offered the COVID-19 vaccine every month, but they always decline. So that's okay. We, we'll put them here in the offer, but decline in three. And then for our unknown and other category would be four. So um, this, this is where um, I noticed some individuals um, kind of mess, um, kind of have errors with their calculations here. Um, and and it, kind of, it stems from their um, person level form. So when using a person level form, um, again, with the 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3, this means that they're just simply not up to date. Because again, remember in two, this means they're up to date, receive their bivalent. So if they're, they're not up to date, then they're simply not up to date. So so for example, so if a resident has not received the bivalent vaccine, um, you know, they're, they're not considered up to date for quarter three. And again, they'll fall into one of these categories. So use, using that form, if a resident is not up to date because they declined the vaccine, that would make them up to date. Then in, in, this, in the form, then the user can enter the approximate date um, they declined. Um, they declined their bivalent. If not, they will automatically be put in this unknown category. So a lot of facilities were, um, you know, uncertain where, where this number auto, auto populated from. So if you do not put in the date that uh, there is a medical contraindication or declined, it will um, populate here. So when you're, um, when you're entering in your form, make sure you can, um, make sure you, you enter in those um, dates or approximate dates of contraindications or declinations or they'll fall into the unknown category. And also for the unknown category. So again, if, if they're, they're not up to date, so for instance, they only receive their, um, if they only receive their um, partial series or not up to date, um, but but they don't fall in the category either of medical contraindications or or decline, then they'll fall here in this unknown category. And I hope that makes sense. So um, in, in so doing now, I can ensure that my sum matches up and, then, and now I have I've completely accounted for all 57, all 57 of my residents. Okay, so now let's move on to our um, changes to weekly COVID-19 vaccination for healthcare personnel form. So for question one, there is no change. Um, the question will remain individuals eligible to work at the facility. Question 2.1 is being removed. So this was um, only one dose of a two dose primary COVID-19 vaccine series. 2.2. So again, that's being removed. We have no changes to question 2.2, 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3. So 2.2 is any completed primary COVID-19 vaccine series, medical contraindication to COVID-19 vaccine, offered but declined, and unknown COVID-19 vaccination status. Question four is being removed, and this is individuals with a complete primary series vaccine who have received any booster or additional dose of COVID-19 vaccine since August 2021. And for question five, there's no change there. This is um, individuals in question two who are up to date um, with the COVID-19 vaccine. So again, so when previously reported, this is what this section looked like. So again, what's being removed um, with the X is here, question 2.1, 2.2, and 5. What's being moved up to date from question 5 to question 4 and keeping questions 1, 2, 3 to 3.3. So this is a screenshot of the new version, um, again, which you all are probably familiar with seeing, um, including up-to-date changes. 
and the reduction of questions. So let's walk through an example. Um, let's walk through an example of this as well, using the weekly um, COVID-19 vaccination revised healthcare personnel form. So before I start, so if you can see these gray boxes here, these are auto-populated. I'm not putting anything in these boxes, just the ones that are clear here. So we're, we're gonna start with our first question, number of healthcare personnel that were eligible to have worked at this healthcare facil facility for at least one day during the week of uh, data collection. So I have two employees, um, staff on facility payroll. I have no licensed independent practitioners. I have one adult student and two other contract personnel. So when I put these in, um, five is auto-populated here and three is auto-populated there. So now we move on to um, cu uh, cumulative number of healthcare personnel in question one who have received their complete primary series COVID-19 vaccine at this facility or elsewhere since December, 2020. So I have two here, zero here, one and one. So now that accounts for, that accounts for four. So now we move on to question three, cumulative number of healthcare personnel and question number one with other conditions. So I have one that has a medical contraindication. I have no declinations, no unknown status. And then to question number four, uh, cumulative number of healthcare personnel and question number one who are up to date. And again, this means that they receive that updated bivalent vaccine. So for my, my facility, I have no staff that have received their updated. And that's okay, as long as, you know, everyone is accounted for, um, if you have zeros, you know, then, then you have zero. So I uh, ensure that all five of my um, healthcare personnel are, um, are accounted for. And, and it's and it's and that's it. That's all you have to do for the revised healthcare personnel form. So again, much simpler, um, uh, much simpler, and reduction of questions. So this um, this COVID nineteen vaccination uh, module tree, um, uh, decision tree again, um, you know, can help you determine um, um, an individual who is up to date. So it's simply have they received an updated bivalent vaccine? Yes, then they are considered up to date. If no, they are not up to date. And again, this is for quarter three reporting, which is June 26th through September 24th. So I know that was a lot of information your heads are probably spinning, but let's try to see if we can apply everything we have learned um, and make sure everyone understands these um, definition changes. So let's start with this first example first. Um, so Tommy Pickles is a nursing home resident who completed his primary COVID-19 vaccine series in January, 2021 and original monovalent booster in October 2021 and an updated bivalent dose on December 25th, 2022. And you should have received the poll um, question on your screen. So is Tommy Pickles considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for quarter three? And I'll give you just a minute to, to think about it and, um, and, um, select your answer and let's see if you are able to determine. Awesome, almost everyone said yes, he is considered up to date, which is correct. So the answer is yes, Tommy is considered up to date for weeks during quarter three since he received an updated bivalent vaccine. So where would you document him? So again, so since he is a resident, you would um, document him in question two. So cumulative number of residents in question one who are up to date with COVID-19 vaccine. So that's where he would go. He would fall under that up to date. Um, he would fall into that up to date um, category. Good job. Almost everyone got it right. Perfect. All right, let's try example number two. So Susie, I'm sorry, Susie Sheep is a nursing home resident 
who completed her primary vaccine series in March 2021 and received an original monovalent booster dose in October 2021, but declined to receive an updated bivalent dose. Is she considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for quarter three? Seeing answers in the chat, no, okay. Perfect, perfect. 98% with no, great, great, great. So, correct, so no, Susie is not considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for weeks during quarter three since she did not receive the most um, recommended updated bivalent vaccine. So where, where would she be documented? So since Susie is a uh, resident, she will be documented in 3.2 in the offered but declined COVID-19 vaccine. Good, you all are so smart, perfect. All right, example number three. Rebecca Rabbit, a healthcare worker, did not complete um, her primary vaccine series, but chose to receive an updated bivalent dose in June 2023. Is she considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for quarter three? And again, that polling question should pop up for you, and I'll give you just a minute to, um, to think about it and answer. Perfect, perfect. Almost everyone got it right. Again, so yes, she is considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for weeks during quarter three since she has received the most recommended updated bivalent dose. So since she's a hair, uh, sorry, since she's a healthcare worker, where would we document? So in question two and question four. So in question two, for cumulative number of healthcare personnel in question one who have received a complete primary series um, at this facility elsewhere in December 2020, and those who are up to date with COVID-19 vaccines. Last one, Danny Dog, a healthcare worker, received partial primary series a single dose of original monovalent Pfizer in June 2021, and is planning on receiving an updated bivalent dose. Is he considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for quarter three? Danny Dog, a healthcare worker, received partial series and planning on receiving an updated bivalent dose. So I'll give you a minute to think about this one as well. You all are so smart. So correct. So no, Danny is not considered up to date with COVID-19 vaccines for weeks during quarter three of 2023 since he did not receive the most recommended updated bivalent dose. So where would we document him? He would be, um, in the 3.3 category unknown slash other COVID-19 vaccination status. And just as a uh, side reminder that the partial primary series, which was formerly question 2.2 was removed. So this is why he would be in that unknown slash other um, COVID-19 vaccination status. So you all are pros, awesome, awesome, awesome. So. Let's move on to our Alliant Health and NHSN update. So on June 30th, 2023, um, NHSN was aware of an issue when a user at its previously saved um, COVID-19 vaccination data for uh, resident and healthcare personnel in the NHSN um, website. So users could initially save their data, but if users attempted to modify their data for question two, an error message was generated and those modifications could not be saved. So I know we see it's quite a few um, emails about that. So as of July 11th, um, the CDC did resolve this issue, um, which prevented modifying and saving resident um, healthcare personnel COVID-19 vaccination data for question two. So users can now modify question number two and save their data. And always as a reminder, you can use um, 
you can always upload a CSV file um, if you would like to enter and or modify um, your data. And another update is um, viewing COVID-19 vaccination summary data quality reports. So um, long-term care facilities are now able to access their data quality reports on the NHSN homepage. So under action items here, um, here in this box here, users, uh, users should see a view my COVID-19 vaccination summary DQ with the date. Um, the data are valid um, from and then you want to click this button to view um, to view your quality data report so once you click it this is what you see you know it will show you your um, it will show you your um, your data report um, and you are, are more than welcome to download and print your um, pdf file so if you need to share it or you know just save a copy um, here's your print function and there is your download there. So again, this is for your um, weekly COVID-19, um, um, your quality report. So um, all future data quality reports will be um, stored. And to navigate between multiple data quality reports, you wanna click this drop down menu um, after reporting name to toggle between different reports. So as you can see here, we have one for um, February 27, 2023 and March 27, 2023. And um, you can review the reports added to your facilities alert screen um, for the month of January um, through March um, and reach out to NHSN at cdc.gov um, with the subject line data quality report um, NHSN weekly COVID-19 vaccination module data January through March 2023. Um, you know, if you have any questions or, um, you know, don't quite understand something. So that's the contact information, contact information there. Um, Another alert we have is the QA alerts um, received a lot of um, questions regarding that. So um, NHSN um, updated on July 8th, 2021 to create new data quality, um, quality alerts for uh, the weekly COVID-19 vaccination modules within the long-term um, care dialysis and healthcare personnel safety components. So these um, data quality quality alerts generate within the application for weekly COVID-19 vaccination module uh, data for residents and long-term care facilities, healthcare personnel and long-term care facilities, healthcare personnel and long and non-long-term care facilities such as hospitals and patients in um, outpatient dialysis uh, facilities. So NHSN regular, uh, regularly uh, reviews data reported through the re weekly COVID-19 vaccination modules to understand trends and to identify potential reporting errors. So data that were potentially entered in error are flagged by the NHSN application and an alert is automatically display, displayed on the application landing page. So alerts for the quality, alerts for the weekly, um, excuse me, COVID-19 vaccination modules are generated when vaccination rates um, for a reporting week are less than or equal to 10%. And I will touch on that in just a second. Um, but if you have any um, questions regarding your QA alerts, I um, have the, um, I have the PDF here that can help you with correcting data that are flagged for potential errors and also useful information. And if you have um, any questions regarding this or are still unable to clear your alerts, um, you can contact NHSN at C NHN Help Desk at NHSN at CDC.gov. So that brings me to my next, um, next alert. So NHSN is also aware of an issue, um, again, uh, that you may see an alert screen related to COVID-19 vaccination. So this alert is generating incorrectly for some facilities saying that they have reported a primary vaccination rate of less than 10% that I just mentioned. So if you receive this, um, please disregard these QA alerts as the alerts are not impacting um, your facility's ability to enter, update, save, or analyze data. And additionally, um, do not edit 
um, your weekly COVID-19 vaccination module data um, within the QA alert screen. So if you're receiving that error, um, um, it's just best to disregard it as of now until further guidance comes from, um, comes from NHSN. And here is, um, I thought this was really helpful, the NHSN help desk uh, resolution timeframes. Um, some, in, um, you know, sometimes you might send an email and you expect a response within a day, but the resolution timeframe just doesn't quite work that way. So um, if you have a request um, that's received 15 days prior to um, a CMS reporting deadline um, and it requires subject matter expert um, involvement, typically look for an answer um, within seven business days and so forth. So um, I really thought this was helpful, you know, just to, you know, to expect when to receive um, a resolution time frame. And if you have a request that's, you know, received um, for business day or less before a CMS reporting deadline, um, it's mentioned that every effort would be made to resolve each request um, before the deadline. And if you um, have any issues, um, any access um, issues related to password resets or incorrect passwords, um, you can always contact the SAMS help desk at samshelp at cdc.gov or call their um, toll free number listed here. And again, if you have any NHSN questions, they may be directed to NHSN at cdc.gov. And I notice I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to quickly go through these last few slides. So um, I just want to um, um, show our new updated website. Um, you can, you know, feel free to check out our um, upcoming events and webinars, as well as our infection control um, resource at quality.alliantehealth.org. And if you want to see our past um, shop talk um, sessions, you can scroll all the way down on that main homepage, um, and here you'll see shop talks, um, shop talks there. And then it'll then take you to this section here, shop talks and quickeners, which is also known as our um, shop talk shorts. And here's the link um, embedded at the bottom that will um, is the link for our YouTube um, shop talk short videos. Um, and you can see we have several videos that are less than six minutes long, so you don't have to sit, you know, through an entire, you know, hour long presentation when it's something that you just need help with really quickly for. So um, we provide um, videos on how to join a group in NHSN um, and how to confer rights and various other topics. So these are typically, again, you know, if you just need help with something really fast, um, we have these great um, shop talk shorts to help um, assist you with those. And that brings me to, um, that concludes the content of my questions. Um, and again, I noticed that I am short for um, short for time. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A um, and we will um, email you back. Um, if you email our patient safety team, um, we will try to get back with you um, as soon as possible with, um, uh, with an answer to your question. And again, as always, thank you so much for your time. Um, and again, you can contact any of us individually on a patient safety team or our joint um, email at patientsafety at alliantehealth.org. And mark your calendar for our um, next, um, you wanna save your spot for our next August shop talk which will be on August 17th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So there's the link. Um, feel free to go ahead and register for that next one. And as always, please feel free to follow us on your favorite social media platform, um, such as Facebook and Twitter. Um, and again, thank you so much for your time and attention. And I hope that you found this um, helpful and that you can understand these um, definitions um, and changes uh, or and even found these simplifications um, more helpful. So again, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon.